Okay, it's seven o five, so we can get started. So, welcome everyone to another apps uh, interactive session of the 2022-2023 of the academic year. We are pleased to host to host you tonight's session with the program director to answer any question that you have about the interview process of the dual degree program. And just a reminder uh, to everyone in the in here, um, especially for all of our attendees, that is that tonight webinar will be is the part of the ongoing support supporting applicant webinar series and we encourage all of the attend attendees today to be looked out for another registration coming up for the next webinar which will be, which will be on September 29th so uh and also I do want to remind everyone that Every, uh, the webinar tonight will be recorded. Uh, will be recorded. So if you have it uh, for some reason you step out of the computer or you want to go back to revisit some of the content that we are you are missing today, uh, it will be posted on our YouTube channel and then we will keep everyone updated. And now I would like to turn our um, uh, microphone back to our, one our wonderful panelists in here and would love to have them introduce themselves so including the institution that you you are representing today so to be more efficient i will be calling you by name and feel free to introduce yourself and also about your background uh, so first i would love i would uh, go with dr um diana Bewick from the uh health and md anderson uh, cancer center yeah, hi. Hi, everybody. Um, it's wonderful that you're joining this webinar to uh, learn about interviewing for the MD-PhD programs. I am an MD-PhD graduate of the University of Texas Southwestern, and I now direct another UT school, UT Health in Houston, and the MD-PhD program there is a joint program between the Health Science Center and MD Anderson. Both of them are located in the Texas Medical Center and are right down the street from each other. Um, I myself do research on um, genetically triggered vascular disease and I absolutely love being a physician scientist. Thank you, Dr. Mirip. So next I will go with Dr. Stephen Lenz from University of Iowa. Hi, uh, I'm Steve Lentz, uh, happy to be here. Um, I'm also an MD, PhD, a physician scientist, uh, graduate of the MSTP at Washington University in St. Louis, but I've spent most of my career at the University of Iowa. Like Dr. Milowitz, I'm a hematologist interested in uh, vascular biology and thrombosis and coagulation. So uh, I spent most of my career mainly in the lab, but also seeing patients uh, you know, every week uh, as a physician scientist. And I'm the director of the MSTP at the University of Iowa, uh, Carver College of Medicine in Iowa City. Uh, we've had a, a funded MSTP since 1977. So we were one of like the first, maybe we were 14th or 15th, I think, among the now 50 some uh, MSTPs that are, that are funded by the NIH. And we're getting ready for another season of interviews coming up soon in a few weeks. Thank you, Dr. Lenz. So next, I would go with Dr. Neil Chi from UC San Diego. Hi, uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, join today. Um, I'm really excited to uh, <clears throat> actually meet all of you. Uh, again, my name is Neil Chi. I'm from the University of California, San Diego, and uh, co-direct the Medical Scientist Training Program of the MD-PhD program here at UCSD. I am also an alum of an MD-PhD program and an MD-PhD that uh, splits his time as uh, wearing multiple hats as some of my other colleagues of um, directing a program administratively because I'm also the assistant dean of physician scientist uh, education here at UCSD and I still am clinically active and in fact I'm currently in the CCU and uh, running a lab so uh, it's definitely uh, uh, very fun and I look forward to actually sharing a little bit about uh, and answering any of the questions you have about physician scientist uh, career. Uh, pathways. Thank you so much, Dr. Chi. So next, I will have Dr. Hannah Broom from uh, the University of Mississippi. Thank you, Min. Um, I'll echo my co-panelists here and say thank you so much for inviting me to participate this evening. Um, I am from the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Uh, I'm an alum of the school. I earned my PhD in biochemistry. 
uh, and have transitioned into education administration over the last few years. And so I'm new to the program director role um, within the last couple of years for our MD PhD program. Um, I work uh, with a co-director who uh, is a physician, an ER physician, and we both work together to, um, to direct the program. And uh, we are also kicking off our interview season here in the, the next couple of weeks. Um, so I'm excited to be here and, and answer any questions that you'll have about the process. Thank you so much, Dr. Broom. So next, I will have Dr. Alicia, Alicia Avanoni from the University of Miami. Thank you, Min, and thanks everybody for being here. Very excited to address your questions. I'm Alessia Fornoni. I'm a physician scientist by training, although a little bit less traditional. I did my medical degree in Italy and my PhD between the NIH and the University of Miami, where I am now the co-director of the STP program and the chief of the Division of Nephrology of Hypertension, and I direct the Drug Discovery Institute. Um, I'm very excited to be here. If there is one thing I have to say, um, this is a wonderful career. Uh, 25 years into my job, I feel like I'm paid for my best hobby, and I'm happy to uh, share this with you as we go in the Q&A session. Thanks. Thank you're muted. You're muted, man. Oh, oh. My, my apologies. So uh, th thank you so much, Dr. Fanoni. So next, I, the last one will be Dr. Brian Scott, uh, Scott from uh, Michigan State University. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself, Dr. Scott. Hi, I'm Brian Schutte from Michigan State University, and I'm the co-director of the DO PhD program in the College of Osteopathic Medicine here in Michigan State. And I'm a basic scientist. Uh, my lab studies craniofacial genetics of disease and development. And uh, happy to be here and, and answer some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Shruti. Uh, so to all of the panelists today, I, I think, uh, we, on the behalf of the APSA uh, virtual content, we want to say thank you so much for being here. We are so grateful that everyone took your time out of your busy schedule to come virtually with us today to share any wisdom, any, uh, any advice to all of the folks who will apply as a career physician of the physician scientist upcoming cycle. And my name is Min Pham. I will be your live moderator today. And I'm a, I'm a currently a postgrad student uh, undergrad at UCLA. And also in the chat box, we have two other members who will have moderating uh, for our event today. We have uh, Eva. Uh, who will be the uh, Q and A chat box uh, moderate, moderating today's class? So that's our it's Eva, and also we have the Danny Matos who will be doing the volunteer live tweeting today on Twitter for everyone. Any question answer will be okay. And for you, for those, still want to remind one more time. So for those of you who are stepping away from the webinar or missing a piece of it, uh, as a reminder that the webinar will be recorded as the moderator. I just want to remind everyone that we submit all of the questions to the Q and A box, and we have all of, uh, and also we have some of the pre-submitted question on the uh, uh, registration. So we will ask uh, that question first, and then we will go over the chat box. And I would highly encourage uh, the panelists to interact with our attendee via the Q and A box as well. If you have any question, feel free to type in. And also, I'm uh, uh, on the on the chat box, we also have the chat directly with all of the attendees. So if you have any major announcement, any general question, uh, feel free to uh, put into the chat box uh, uh, with our attendee as well. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that's all of the announcement that I have. So thank you so much again for being here. So now I will go ahead and start with the first question that will be submitted to the webinar. Um, so the first one will be, uh, so what made an applicant stand out in the interview? Any panelists want to take on this question? I'll, I'll start. Jump in. Or, uh, go, go ahead, Alicia. Um, I'll I'll go ahead and start and say for us, um, what it naturally starts to to trend as as being something that stands out is when a student is is very visibly um excited about or engaged in 
uh, research and the past research experiences that they've had, um, it, you can very easily kind of parse those students uh, apart from those that might be just regurgitating what they they wrote in their essays um, for their application. So that's definitely something that stands out to us is is a visible excitement about uh, research and the the career in research. I want to yeah. say on that, um, I really think that uh, the most important spa aspect is passion. This career is not about getting a free medical education. So this career is about nurturing a passion and a strong sense of intellectual curiosity. So when I see how it's sparkling, when you talk about a research idea and hypothesis, what would you do? the dream to be able to touch the sky and with discovery is really what uh, make an applicant a very strong one and somebody who can really express that passion in a very humble and compassionate way without a arrogant I can do it all mentality so those are all aspects that for me are extremely important you know you're all very competitive you all come with great scores uh, MCAT a little bit plus minus, but we know that these are not correlated to successful outcome in physician scientist career, no? So really the the grasp of intellectual curiosity is what count the most for me. Dr. Shilpi, do you want to say something? I saw you unmute. It's, no, it's fine. They, they did great. And Dr. Chi, I also saw you uh, unmute. Oh, uh, I don't know if I'm on mute, but Min, uh, actually, you went out. So can you just repeat the question one more time? I think I know what it is just from listening to the answers. Absolutely, yes. So what might an applicant stand out in, in an interview? Yeah, you know, I would agree with my colleagues here. I mean, I think research is a, a real key component, but really kind of uh, sort of thinking about in the terms of uh, <clears throat> thinking about research and impact of how that might be with biomedical scientists or biomedical discoveries. Um, really thinking about, uh, uh, have you really thought about what it means as a becoming a physician scientist, what that, uh, what sort of, um, what trajectory that might be, what your long-term goals are. So research is one, definitely one key component, but right, research can be for those who are interested in pursuing a PhD, but those who have sort of that interest of melding the two of, of actually being a physician and a scientist is sort of a kind of a key component of uh, the sort of the physician scientist career pathway. So it's, it's very much in line with what my colleagues are saying. That's sort of things that we're kind of looking at for these, uh, for the candidates. So I will go to the next question. So the second question is, uh, the applicant asked, uh, are, are all of the interview would be virtual? Do we have any in-person option? Yes. Ours uh, are in-person, yeah. Yeah, we're, do, we're doing both. We're doing just virtual. Yeah, we're, we're, we're doing just virtual. And uh, I think I saw something from the uh, National MD-PhD Directors uh, Group, the great group that 90 plus percent of MD PhD programs are doing virtual or mainly virtual interviews. Yeah. Uh, we do we do plan to do uh, in person second visits, uh, you know, pandemic uh, allowing. Uh, and uh, we decided not to go with an option or a hybrid uh, just to make sure make sure we maintain parity and we're unbiased and didn't put any applicants who were maybe at financial disadvantage, uh, you know, in a bad spot, uh, having to make that decision. Same philosophy for the University of Miami. We are doing first round of virtual only to allow to capture the underserved and uh, we will do the revisit in person. I would echo what uh, Steve and Licia said. We are the same, uh, we are virtual first, for that very reason of equity. Uh, inclusion is a very important aspect for us at the University of California uh, all across the campuses. Um, and as Steve said, we recently had a meeting um, in the last week or two where actually it was polled and the greater than probably 90% are probably along the lines of doing virtual. Um, and 
more broadly, my understanding of the AAMC is the medical schools are beyond just the MD PhD programs are thinking along the same lines uh, just for the medical school. But that means that we still have an opportunity, as Steve mentioned, I think many of us are thinking, you know, it's hard to make a decision if you don't see the campus. So a second is kind of nice so they can see the campus. I don't know how people managed two years ago to choose a school without seeing it. So, uh, and they did. And uh, I, th I think it worked out well for everybody at the end of the day, but it uh, was a really quite interesting. Yeah, I think this is the new normal, not only for medical school interviews, but residency and fellowship. I was talking to a fellow today on rounds we're just starting fellowship interviews, uh, you know, and they're all virtual. And that's a challenge for those guys to match at a program that they haven't seen. So everybody has to get really good at Zoom interviews. Yeah, I agree with Steve. I think they're World here to stay. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Chi and Dr. Lance. I think that's both uh, a good answer into a segue for another question. So when you mentioned about the two separated program, so the next question they are asking is that, are there a separating uh, MD and the PhD interview for each of the program? At well, our I'll, institution, I'll, I'll, we do, yeah. oh, sorry, Steve. Um, at our institution, the medical school interviews uh, the candidates separately from our MD PhD admissions committee. Um, and in terms of timing, uh, we have done it both ways where those two interviews are on the same day um, and we've done it where they are on different days. Yeah, so all, all the applications are through AMCAS. So you don't have to do a separate application to a PhD program. Uh, and uh, at our institution, we do uh, MSTP interviews and college of, college of medicine interviews on the same day, on the same itinerary. Uh, but there are there's sort of a morning set of interviews with the college of medicine and uh, and an afternoon set of interviews with uh, MD PhD faculty. But we try to make it. We're actually learning to do it better by Zoom. Each you know this is our second or third crack at it. So we're trying to make it more efficient and simpler and less less stressful for the interviewees by you know, making the day a little shorter and getting it all scheduled at one time. So we do a little differently at Michigan State. So we, we have the same, uh, the medical school is reviewing the students. Uh, and then we also meet with them in the afternoon on the, as the DOPHD program. But then they also will come in uh, later to interview with specific graduate programs that they want, that they're interested in pursuing. And um, that is a, um, uh, the, the graduate program pays for that, for that trip for them to come and visit uh, so they can see the, see the campus and to see the, the program in person. We, we do something similar um, at UMMC where we'll, the graduate school will bring back our uh, MD-PhD admitted students and we will kind of speed date is what we call it through the different grad programs yeah we keep we keep separate interview for md and md phd we make sure that in the day for the md phd the directors are met some committee members are met and scientists that are requested by the applicants are met um, uh, which personalize a little bit the interview process for them one thing i want to say is that uh, I think I'm proud to say that the MSTP program have a lot of saying into whether we want a student to be admitted or not, and we can twist the harm of the medical school. Should medical school feel like the applicant is not very strong, we can actually uh, overpower that if we feel like the person, the individual fit the best the criteria for a perfect physician scientist. Thank you to our panelists. The next question is more about research. So what the attendee asked that if you have multiple significant research experience, at least uh, at least for one year, maybe more than one year, uh, which one should I focus on with an interview to talk about? 
I think that um, the interviewees should be prepared to talk about all research experiences, because <laughs> it's not unusual that the person interviewing will look at the list of research experiences listed on the AMCAS application and know one particular area and focus their questions in that area. So I really recommend the interviewees go back and review the science, the hypothesis and what they did in the lab, even recontact the lab if they don't know what the end result of their project was and be, be prepared to discuss any of those research experiences. And we don't want to hear about, you know, how tough it was to clone that little fragment into the plasmid or whatever. We want to know that they understood the overall hypothesis and the goals of the project and then, then talk about what difficulties they had and how they overcame it. And the entire time they should be passionate about research. <laughs> I so much agree with Diana, and I, I really would start <laughs> start uh, start being prepared for the project you like the most, the one where you know you're very excited. No, that will not betray you, but be prepared to address questions if uh, the interviewer asks you about other research projects you're engaged with. Yeah, I agree. You know, you should know know them all, but be prepared that someone may ask you to pick one. You know, tell tell me tell me one you're excited about and describe that and. What we're looking for is, have you really thought about the big picture and thought about the research in depth? Uh, we're not interested in the techniques you did. You learned very superficially in one summer after another. We're, you know, if you're really passionate about science, you will have thought about the big picture and how you, how what you did fits into what the what the group is trying to accomplish. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with what everybody says. I think Steve hit the kind of the word for us or the way when we think about it's a little bit depth, actually. So <clears throat> I, mean, I may have misheard the question, but uh, there may have been a component of, of time. And oftentimes in terms of thinking about being able to speak about research uh, deeply and in depth and understanding it, sometimes it takes a little bit more than a year of time of doing that sort of research, especially if you're passionate, you're going to want to do it. And then it comes out very easily when one speaks about it. And that's what we're looking for. As Diana said, we're not, the techniques is not so much as important as really, did you understand what you were doing and how passionate are you? And, and what sort of things would you do following up uh, those particular uh, studies? So and one has really thought about it and really passionate they'll be able to figure that out and they'll shine in the interview. So again, we, we value depth over breadth and you gotta remember these interviews are gonna be very short and, and so practice that elevator talk. And I would really focus on that one project where you have ownership. That's the word I, I like to use is ownership. You understand it forwards, backwards, and you know the words that we've heard, hypothesis, the significance, um, interpretation, hopefully you've, you've been able to participate in that side of science too. And, and if you, if you have, you can, uh, get into that. And that, that's really an important part of science. And, and it demonstrates that you've already, you're already on that path of becoming a scientist. So that's great to see. I'll echo Brian on the significance part too, and the, the relevance or, um, translation. Uh, often students will, like Diana, I think mentioned, get into the weeds of the, the steps to clone that that into a plasmid, you know, and um, we want to know that the student has also looked at that project from a, a 10,000 foot or 30,000 foot level and kind of seen where it fits in or could fit in um, in, in a bigger picture. Thank you to our panelists. So the next question, we will switch a little bit to the Q&A box along with the chat function to see if we have any question. Currently, I saw Dr. Shruti is typing on the chat also. But the question from Mackenzie is, uh, Mackenzie asked that, how can an, an in individual best prepare for an MD-PhD interview? So I started to write, I'll just answer. We've already, we, you know, we've already had um, two similar questions and, and both of research really stuck out. And, and that's what sticks out for us too. Somebody 
who, who is already on that path towards becoming a scientist and has demonstrated that um, through, through the work that they've done as an undergrad or as a post or wh wherever they're at. Um, and, and again, we value depth of the research uh, and, and, you know, if, you, if you're passionate about it, you're gonna own it and, and you, you have to be able to demonstrate that. And, and again, I'm gonna say practice that elevator talk because these interviews are gonna come and go very quickly and, and you may be really crushed for time in order to get that, um, to, to, to share that passion. I, I would say, I would answer the question a couple ways. One is do everything you can to, to be prepared for a Zoom interview. You know, check out your computer technology ahead of time, log on early, think, you know, you know practice that a little bit, the, the Zoom stuff. And then the other advice I would give is really try to be yourself. Don't try to be someone you're not, you know, don't try to project something that you think we're looking for. We, you know, one thing I really enjoy is, is the story of how you became to be interested in applying to an MD PhD program. People come from all different perspectives. You know, when I was in college, I never thought I wanted to be a doctor. I was like going for science. I thought I'd do a PhD and I said, oh, there's, there's MD PhD programs. Maybe I should take a look at those. And so I, you know, I got in, I became a doctor and I found I've enjoyed being a physician. But other people want to start out wanting to be physicians and they don't, they don't have opportunities to do science for a while. And then they, they find their way to that. So I kind of like the diversity and the different stories. And I think don't be afraid to tell your story. Because uh, we're looking for people with all sorts of different stories. Uh, you know, however they found their way to this career, it has to be the right career for you. So that's what I enjoy about the interviews is the passion for science and hearing the, the, the path the tra that everybody's traveled to get here. I think, then I would, I, I think I would, it's I'll, the most ahead. common. Sorry. No, you go ahead. I think this is the most common word we have heard tonight, passion. I think that should send a very straight message to all the attendees. And, uh, you know, one thing that I want to say, it makes it a little bit more difficult on Zoom to really connect and show the passion. But don't forget that uh, eye contact is important also if you have a remote visit, a remote interview, you know? So, look at your camera when you talk and make sure you show the passion. We can see it from a sparkle of your eyes and it's important to demonstrate that. Anna, sorry, I spoke over you. Oh no, you're good. Um, I agree with everyone. I was gonna add uh, kind of echoing what Steve said about being uh, yourself and being genuine. Um, I tell students a lot of times, you, you're not interviewing with us to be a physician scientist. You're interviewing with us to be a student in an MD-PhD program. So we're not expecting you to know all of the things um, that a physician scientist knows. We want you to be teachable and eager and show um, an attitude that uh, shows that you are reflective and um, you've got the grit and the passion to get you through uh, a seven-year program, which is the length of ours, so. You know, Hannah said that it's really interesting, the grit. That's actually a key component, actually. Uh, this is, a, it's, a, it's a long program, seven to eight years. And actually, it's interesting in some of our um, annual directors meetings, we talk about what's one key component to, <clears throat> that actually tips off that student's going to do well, going to make it through and succeed and actually grit. And then so uh, along the lines, I think Steve's talking about how you got there and became that decision. Some of that actually is, is somewhat helpful for us because it really gives us an idea of, as Alicia said, was saying how passionate you really are in the end of the day. And are you really making an informed decision? Do you know what you're getting yourself into? And some of the things that where you may have gone through that may not have been so such great points in your life that, that you overcome actually helps. And in, and in many ways of helping us understand that you really are committed and very interested in this career path. 
Thank you to our panelists. So I just want to um, thank you so much for the, before we move on, moving on to the next question, I just want to make a quick announcement that the section today will be recorded and will be, post on, will be posted on our YouTube channel. So all of our moderator will, is gathering all of the questions submitted in the uh, Q&A box, the chat box, and also the pre submitted questions. So we will try our best to address all of the questions. So if we, uh, if for some reason we cannot answer all of them, we will, we will work with our virtual content to see if we can send it to the panelists to follow after maybe all of the questions. And hopefully we have that answer by the end of the day. Um, so the next question is also from a Q&A chat from an, uh, another pers uh, anonymous person. So how would you recommend an applicant respond to the research related related interview question if they do not know the answer to? I can start. I personally don't mind, you know, you're here to train, to learn. Uh, if you're humble enough to say, I really don't know, but I can guarantee you I will know by tomorrow morning because I cannot sleep peacefully over unanswered questions. This is a question that would turn me on because what I tolerate the least is people sitting comfortably on ignorance that doesn't desire to improve. There's nothing wrong in being ignorant. You're gonna be, by being a physician scientist at any stage of your career, you need to accept to be ignorant. I'm ignorant in so many ways but being humble to admit it and to actually commit to the work to make that, to change that is what make the physician scientists maintain that inquisitive mind that will be transformative. I think you should answer that question um, the way we encourage um, students to answer questions during their qualifying exams for their PhD. You can say, I don't know the answer as to whether protein A interacts with protein B, but I do know that there's this interaction and that that's important for this disease pathway or something. So, you know, a little bit of the bait and switch over to what you do know so that you can illustrate your knowledge in the field that you were working in. I think it's fine to say you don't know when you don't know. There's so much we don't know. Um, but again, I look for the passion. I, with the answer I would want to see is, boy, I don't know, but that's a great question. You know, what, you know, what, sh what should I be thinking? You know, uh, wow, thank you. Uh, it's the same, same idea of, you know, going back to the lab and thinking about that and knowing the answer by tomorrow. But uh, don't try to fake it whenever you do. Thank you so much to all the power panelists. So the next question is uh, more about the application. Uh, so um, the question is, when should I expect an, an invite for an interview? And if I do not get accepted for many interviews, uh, or receive, receiving any acceptance, when should we when should I reconsider to reapply? Actually, Min, can you can you repeat that question, please? Yes, yes. I, yeah, it's a long question. So, when should I expect an interview invite? And uh, if I do not uh, get accepted any interview invite or receiving any acceptance, when should I reconsider to reapply? So, so everybody needs to understand that the, the interview and acceptance season lasts a long time. Seems like it lasts most of the year. Uh, 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 in our program, we have already started uh, offering interview uh, spots and we will continue to interview through the end of December. Some programs interview into January and maybe even a little bit later. Um, we do most of our interviews between late September and late December. Um, and it's a rolling process. So we're gonna continue to be inviting people for interviews uh, during that whole time. Um, and our program works on a rolling acceptance uh, uh, pattern. So we will start accepting people for admission to our MSTP within a few weeks after uh, the interviews in some cases. But that, but we will continue to do that all the way through the spring and you know, often into April or May. 
uh, as uh, a lot of students hold multiple acceptances and are on wait lists and hold lists. And I think we all wish the process would get over sooner, but it tends it tends to be getting longer rather than shorter in our in our uh, uh, situation. Um, if you know if you don't get in during that season, you can apply the following year. Uh, but that would be your, I think, your soonest opportunity to reapply. Um, you know, the other thing that might be interesting to to listeners is, I think, I think the most recent data there are about eighteen hundred applicants to MD PhD programs every year, something like that, and about six hundred to seven hundred get accepted or get matriculated. So. About a third of all the people who apply to MD PhD programs get in somewhere. But obviously those 1800 applicants are applying to multiple programs. So each program has, you know, hundreds of applicants. And, um, uh, you know, that's, that's why the, the interview process. I've asked the question, how many, how many students are interviewed each year? And I don't think we have that data. We don't know exactly how many of the 1,800 applicants to MD PhDs actually get interviews? Because uh, the programs don't report that data. Uh, but I think it would be interesting to report that data in the future and, and get a sense of that. I was going to say um, or add on to that about uh, if you don't get in, um, what do you do? Uh, use your resources contact the schools that offer it. I know our school offers um, post-application counseling to uh, really sit down and look at your application with the admissions staff, talk about areas that you can strengthen your application. Um, so do that. Uh, don't, don't necessarily only rely on your own judgment, right, to, to improve your application for a reapplication. Um, our school offers uh, a, a, a non-traditional or alternate entry path into our MD-PhD program. This may be something that's offered at other institutions also. Uh, we accept current medical students into our MD-PhD program. So um, I think one of the chat questions was, um, when, when or how do we decide what are the signs that we would recommend a student to, to take the MD only versus MD PhD. Um, our admissions committee will often recommend to uh, an applicant to, um, to reapply for our MD PhD program as a medical student after they've taken uh, the opportunity to get some additional research experience um, as a medical student. So that, that is another pathway into our MD-PhD program at UMMC. Yeah, just to add to the C interview season, many of the programs uh, start up uh, at different times. I will tell you, for us, we are one of the later schools. We will not start our interviews in January. So those of you who are interested in UCSD, uh, we may not start inviting people until uh, later in the fall, which, and this is actually quite true for different schools. You can, as you heard from uh, Steve from the University of Iowa, and probably many on the line may start their interviews already this month. Uh, others, and it does seem like the West Coast schools will tend to start a little bit later. It does sometimes seem to be uh, regional. So don't panic if you have not quite heard now uh, it is a long season, and as Steve mentioned, it can very well go out into April. Uh, so, um, and, you know, I think Hannah's point is good, uh, and I think we for certain and other MD-PhD programs will accept students from the medical school uh, phase. Um, obviously, no guarantees, but that is an option. Sometimes you're not sure, or you get you realize when you get into medical school that you want to go down that pathway. So, uh, and I think it's, you know, a, a way that the MD PhD programs are thinking about um, encouraging students into the career pathways through uh, after spending a year or two in medical school, maybe having even a little bit of research time in medical school, like, hey, this is really cool. 
I want to try this out uh, as an actual career pathway. And certainly have students and probably others on the line have students that have come through that pathway. So I agree with everything the other panelists have said. I want to say one thing though. So if you come in with a reapplication a years later, because this is career you really want, please highlight what you have done in the past year to make your applications more competitive. Uh, what I hate is to see the exact application coming here, coming in two years in a row with no sign of improvement, just stubbornly thinking I deserve it, I'm good, I have to get it. Listen to what Anna says, develop your, you know, uh, reach out, see what you can do to improve, uh, get feedback from others. By and large, the best thing you can do to improve your application if you want to go um, MD, PhD, is to do more research and hopefully get your name on some pub publications. Yeah, I would say that if you reapply and you've not done any research in the in the year in between applications, that's a red red flag, a negative red flag for us. Thank you to our panelists. So the next question is a very specific question. So I see from another attendee. So this is a very niche question. So uh, the uh, attendant asked that if anyone have any, any thought about the Oxcam, which is Oxford and Cambridge program, if uh, and if uh, they have ever had any student group to go to, uh, they would be interesting to hear about more and then what factor into the interview. So I, I can speak to that, I guess. We, we've we not had an OxCam uh, trainee, but we've considered it a couple of times over the years. Um, uh, the, the, the issue for us is that um, if, if one of our students is getting their PhD in Oxford or Cambridge or at the NIH, um, how, to, how to really engage them in our program. Uh, because our, our MD PhD program is a lot more than just getting a PhD and getting an MD. There's there's programmatic activities that our students uh, participate in that are that we think are valuable to their development, their career development as a physician scientist. And so we would have to, on an individual basis, try to figure out how to integrate that OxCam student into our program, uh, not just come in for the medical school years. Um, it's it's probably a little bit easier now since we're we've all gotten we're used to virtual activities. You know, it was a it was a real challenge in the past when a student was off campus, but now it may be easier uh, to participate in programmatic activities uh, virtually uh, than it was in, in prior years. So we would we would entertain those those applicants on a case by case basis. Yeah, we. We've had uh, one experience with a student at NIH, and um, they did their research at NIH, and I'll and and it just so happened that one of the their primary mentor here at Michigan State had a collaborator at NIH, and so they ended up spending two of their four years of graduate work uh, at the NIH doing their research there. But that was kind of a special case because you know it was a, it was a strong collaboration between a, 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 a the primary mentor at Michigan State. So trying to, to do two different sides of the, of the training at two different places, again, as Steve says, we, we, we have this really integrated system and, and we think that's what students need and, and that's what we would prefer. So I, we have currently four OxCam students in our program and is some uh, the person who may have asked it and others uh, on the line might know is actually the OxCam, there are different tracks. <clears throat> uh, I don't remember them. I think there are three tracks in different uh, varieties, some that were uh, highlighted by Steve and Brian. Uh, we have them in actually every flavor possible. Those that have actually start their medical school and then go off to uh, Oxford. We've had others that have done it at Oxford or Cambridge. And then they've completed their PhD. I think this is, I think, what Steve might be mentioning. And then coming back and actually 
coming to our medical school. Um, and then uh, we've had one that actually decided to, who came into the MD PhD program, but that decided not to come through our UCSD program, but through the Oxcam because he was accepted to both and decided to go to Oxcam, but he's still part of our MDP, uh, part of our medical school, which was a very interesting situation. It's a kind of an unusual one. Um, so we do, and we, uh, it's not frequent, but we do have hi a history of it. I think we've graduated at least two or three in the last five or six years. So it can happen. Integration is, uh, I appreciate what Brian and Steve said, that is a key component. That is the main, one of the biggest components of an MD PhD uh, program is the community. And uh, we have uh, worked hard to try to integrate these students at different levels. Um, and, but without going into de details, we have figured out ways to integrate them, uh, not only through activities, but we have also communities within our MD PhD program where they have big SIBs and little SIBs so that these students, when they do come out, come to our program a little asynchronously, they are hooked up with students actually within certain communities uh, within our MD PhD program. So it's an interesting question. Uh, and I don't know if there was a part of the question as to how to make that decision. And, you know, I, I think you kind of have to read and explore the different uh, options within Oxcam. There could be somebody that you're really interested in at Oxford or Cambridge or the NIH, uh, that often what happens. And then um, what happens is they decided to do a PhD there. And then afterwards they applied to medical school. So um, I would highly encourage uh, those of you who are interested in that pathway to kind of read it because it's a little bit, it's, it's a really interesting pathway, but one that you have to be sure that you understand because there isn't a guarantee to getting into a medical school after you get your PhD, you do have to apply, but where the guarantee comes in, I believe it's the NIH will help support the medical school phase. So, uh, interesting question. <laughs> Thank you to all of our panelists. So the next question is also from the Q&A chat box. Uh, so the question is about the MMI interview. So do any of your institution have conducting the mon multiple mini interview format and if so how do you recommend preparing for this well i guess i'll go first and admit that we have the mmi i think that uh i think people of the medical schools are uh, uh have different policies or even reevaluating the mmis but uh, we have uh, the MMI. With regards to preparation, it's interesting as the medical school uh, says and recommends, and I would kind of agree with that. There's not much that you can do uh, with actually preparing for it uh, per se. Uh, it really is meant as a way to see how well you can communicate uh, on your feet. So, uh, you know, how one prepares for that is a, is a tricky uh, question. So, um, and the questions are uh, not necessarily why you want to go to medical school. They're actually uh, usually medically related questions that there are no clear right or wrong answer necessarily. It's more how the candidate actually approaches uh, answering that particular question. So preparation is a little bit tough in that sense uh, because uh, really what we're testing for, or the goal of the MMI is seeing how one communicates. I'll offer a little bit of advice on how you can prepare for an MMI very generally and broadly. Um, with an MMI, like uh, Neil was saying, they're really looking at how well you communicate. Well, how well you communicate depends on, in a lot of ways, have you taken time to reflect on your experiences that you've had in your life and fit that into a relevance for yourself? Um, and 
use the experiences that you've had to inform your stance on a particular um, scenario or circumstance or your stance on, you know, your opinion in a matter. And so um, big ticket items that you can kind of concept map or reflect on in from your own life are things like, what do you value in leadership? How um, do you resolve conflict? What is an effective team environment or an ineffective one? And can you, in an MMI scenario, not only kind of give your stance on that or your opinion on that, but pull from your own personal experience and explain how that um, is relevant. That's having a conversation with the with the rater or the interviewer, um, and it's showing them that you're a person, you're a real person who has had experiences that have informed where they are in their life and how they, you know, present and and how they have opinions on things. Well, I'm glad I, we didn't have that when I applied. I think I would have flunked that. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to be a scientist. Uh, we don't use the MM uh, or whatever it is the MMI, but we have a, a, a similar. You know, we have some questions like that just reflecting on how times have changed. Thank you so much for all of the advice. So uh, we can go with one more question and then we can wrap up for the webinar today. Uh, so the next question is also also from the chat box from uh, um, Megna. Uh, so the question is to what extent and the nature of a clinical experience might a strong candidate for an MD PhD program? So at Michigan State, it's it's quite important because the process we do is is you're interviewing your first interviews are going to be with the medical college, and and so um, they're looking for that. It's 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 as important to them as the research is to the basic scientists that you're going to be interviewing with later that day and, and in a couple months. So um, and and we're in the osteopathic college or the DOs. And so if you're interested in osteopathic medicine, then obviously those medical um, shadowing experiences, the medical experiences, you need to have that experience in the area of medicine and that discipline that you're interested in. So I'll stop there. Yeah, at, at the University of Miami is also extremely important to show sufficient shadowing experience. While I personally don't believe that's key to become a great physician scientist, uh, I have to say the medical school, I mentioned before we can twist their arm, but if there is not a sufficient number of shadowing hours where you really feel like you get really the passion also for the medical profession, uh, I think this is actually a, a red flag for the application for us. So it is important. So I, I think you, you know, you were looking that you've had enough clinical exposure and you've thought about it enough that you really know you wanna be a physician. And there's not a minimum number of shadowing hours to do that. And fortunately, we've been able to convince our College of Medicine Admissions Committee not to count the shadowing hours or to, or to give MD, PhD applicants, uh, you know, to, to consider that in a different perspective. And we've also reminded them that there are diversity and opportunity issues with this shadowing. You know, uh, not everybody can afford to go on a mission trip to Honduras uh, and have a bunch of hours of shadowing. And, and we, we do take that into account. It's also hard to do uh, put the hours into the research lab and also do the same amount of uh, clinical work that a typical medical student does. And we realize that and our medical school realizes that also. So if you're putting your time and effort into doing research, that's really what we want to see. But at the same time, we need to know that you understand what you're getting into in terms of medicine. So, but but just not to the, we don't expect the same extent as we do for a typical medical student.
Thank you so much for all of the panelists uh, answering the question. So I just want to say thank you so much for coming today and thank you everyone for joining us for our Q&A session today with the current student. I just want to say that um, uh, the participant, uh, all of the uh, this session won't be possible without the support from all of the panelists, as everyone in here, and also for all of the participants who made this uh, session very so very interactive, and also so many people from the APSA Virtual Content Committee, Jedi Public Relations Partnership Committee, uh, Gabby Stephen and APSA leadership, and uh, with without all of the work. This uh, webinar will won't be possible, and we just make sure that students from under under represented uh, medical application will receive the work as well. And we are currently planning in the process for the next webinar coming up for the next interactive section. So feel free to stay tuned on our social media to look out for the next event and also on our email as well. And I just want to say that on behalf of the APSA Virtual Content Committee today, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Fanani, Dr. Milwick, Mil Dr. Broom, Dr. Chi, Dr. Lenz, Dr. Shuti uh, for coming today to help us. And uh, uh, we wish you to have a wonderful day and, and hopefully you will come back to our next webinar in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.